Scorpio, October 23rd to November 21st. Scorpios at their best are mysterious, fearless, and bold. Scorpios at their worst are violent, secretive, and untruthful. Scorpio's horoscope is, find comfort in a new friend coming your way. My name is Vriska Circuit. You might have heard about me, probably from my so-called friends. Carcat didn't want me to write anything to you guys, said I'd scare you off. These Lucis molesters are telling lies about me, and I'm sick of it. These idiots would be dead without me. Do you understand that? Not hypothetically, not figuratively, literally dead. Because they can't do what needs to be done, and I can. Yet here they are, going on and on about how horrible it was to be in a game with me. Well, I'm not letting Carcat fuck up how it all went down. Do you understand? This is my story. Rex Duo Decim Angelus. On top of Mount Fatum, we made our base. Twelve angels assembled to tear down the unjust black monarchs clad in carapace. One might imagine that the Black Queen being presumed dead and out of the picture thanks to Karkat's subterfuge would make our final fight with her dreaded matesprit easier, but the contrary proved true. The Black King no longer craved conquest, for his life without his beloved was without meaning. To add insult to injury, the poor bastard was also cursed with being a frog something the Dursite morons hate for some reason. Falling into nihilism, he roared to the heavens, shaking our very mountain base. We knew he would be there soon. His powers were monstrous. After being imbued with the abilities of our own Lusai, he stood miles high, with legs like great stone monuments topped by his impossible figure, spanning miles in length. From Mount Fatum we could see him coming towards us, each lumbering step crushing his own troops underfoot, his two heads bellowing in symphony. In the Black King's hands, a golden scepter, as long as his arm, topped in a blue sphere, encircled by twelve orbs like a crystalline planet with twelve effervescent moons, each glowing a different color, each corresponding to our very blood each one imbued with the powers of our Lusai. It was our theory that each orb orbiting the sphere of his scepter corresponded to our Lusai, and if shattered, the king would lose their powers. It was a tenuous approach at best, untested. We had no alternative. As the king made his approach, we planned and plotted with the fury of the doomed. Everyone had a part to play. Everyone but the weak link, the intoxicated clown, had a goal, and each had to go off without fail. As the Black King approached, the first up was Aradia Megiddo, the maid of time in her gunmetal gray body. Aradia on her own was weak, but in multitudes even the lowest blood is deadly. The Black King was blindsided by Aradia's metallic doomed clones emerging from the firmament and the forest below, assaulting him without remorse. They mobbed him, giving their doomed lives to clog his throats so he could not scream a vast glub, wiping us all from Skya. Aradia, the Maid of Time, flew to the fuchsia orb upon the King's scepter and with paradoxical powers, shattered it with a metallic fist. With a final swipe of his immense hand, the king plucked her out of the air and she was cast into parts unknown. Aradia's sacrifice was not in vain. As the orb shattered, so too did the king, his carapace shining and reforming, losing the power of our guardian. Next up was Salix, our Mage of Doom. The most powerful psionic Alternia had ever seen, he kept the king at bay with great beams emerging from his eyes, red and blue, alternating in a dizzying pattern. The king was not as large now that he had lost the powers of a horror terror, but he still towered above us all as we descended the mountain to greet him. Solix's suppressing fire made possible the assault by Nepeta and Equius, champions of martial prowess. They scaled his legs like tree trunks, gouging and stabbing through carapace where they could, using the air of Void's might and the rogue of Heart's agility. 
The king was brought to his knees with a mighty bellow, blinded by Solix, rubbing his useless eyes in agony. But only one head was so incapacitated. Solix was soon kept at bay by his depleting power reserves and the undivided attention of the king, his unfettered head's eyes locked upon him. Next came Terezi's assault. Terezi's hand on affairs was always subtle. She had prepared a most ingenious plot to use the tyrant's size against him. While the king was distracted with Solix, Nepeta, and Equius, Terezi, the seer of mind, zipped about using her red rocket, and like the humble gun gunnat of my home planet, placed small yet potent explosive charges on the king's shining skin. These efforts set the stage for our own little tyrant, Pfeffery Pisces, the Witch of Life, to lay another trap. Using her powers, she began to siphon the king's energy into herself, sapping him of power. Using those life energies, Aridin, the Prince of Hope, sent this power back at the weakened king in a blinding white flash. The kneeling king recoiled in rage, falling back. Terezi used this opportune moment to detonate her dormant bombs, causing the king's very carapace to crack. Our plan now was for him to fall over, to topple like a tree, but we underestimated the Black King's might. To our astonishment, he staggered, but did not fall. In fact, for our trouble, his rage was greater than ever. He roared and from his own eyes shot psionic beams utterly obliterating our hideout and the peak of the mountain. The assembled combatants watched in terrified awe as we felt doom creep closer. The mountain hideout had been our fortress, carved into the very stone, impenetrable as anything nature had ever created, and the Black King had turned it into an avalanche of rubble in the time it takes to blink one's eyes. Karkat, our Knight of Blood, thought fast. In response, he sent out a two-pronged attack. The first prong was Kanaya Mariam, Sylph of Space, with her gargantuan chainsaw. Equius and Nepeta threw her into the air, hurtling her towards the king with bloodlust in her eyes where she began to somersault over herself, chainsaw outstretched like a grim, deadly spinning top. The effort paid off. The king's blood came down like rain, when the hand he raised to defend himself from Kanaya's whirling dervish was cleft from his wrist. The second prong of the attack was the Page of Breath, Tavros Nitrum. Sadly, Karkat severely overestimated Tavros's power, and in spite of his massive lance and stylish rocket-propelled wheelchair a pretty girl once gave to him, Tavros was crushed in short order by the impotent flailing of the king. We watched cringing as he fell to the ground like a dead bird after his rocket chair was swatted from the sky. Yet, even behanded, the king did not fall. His mind was fueled only by rage and torment now, both of our own design. Each time we struck, he simply became more frothing with fury. Karkat was at a loss. Solix was unconscious, Tavros was missing, and Aradia presumed dead. The rest of our team was exhausted. It was too early for our trump card. There was no one to call upon. Our conundrum was solved for us, however. Gamzee, the Bard of Rage snapped when he saw Tavros fall from the heavens. His eyes gleamed crimson, and we stood in awe as he raised his fists and simply leapt into the air at the king's left side, unblinded head. For that split second, as Gamzee roared with unholy vigor, the king was no longer enraged. Gamzee had sapped that from him. All that remained on the king's left head was abject, horrible terror the same expression on our faces. None of us are sure how it happened, but Gamzee took the left head off, leaving the king blind and re-angered. Blind, re-angered, but not dead. Karkat and I met eyes, and for the first time in my life, I saw trust reflected back at me. He nodded, and I acted. I was the failsafe. I was. I 
am their savior. I released the dice from my hands, rolling for initiative, and each one of my trusty D8s landed side up, showing eight dots on their face. Eight to the power of eight. Blue glow covered my body. My co-gamers watched in awe as I ascended, revealing my wings, revealing my own ascendant godhood as a sword manifested in my hand. They were forced to simply observe my power. I flew towards the Black King without fear, but I did not fly towards his remaining head nor his heart, but towards his scepter, towards the orb atop it, and with a final shattering sound, the reverberant gasp of breaking glass, the King's carapace broke and his scepter fell inert onto the forest below. The King was dead. The silence that followed was better than the cheering of any crowd. For the first time since this infernal game had begun, we were at peace. Teamwork was our salvation, and I was the most vital of them all. That's how we won the game. The game wasn't over, of course, and there was still much to do before the final eruption. Once the Black King's scepter is destroyed, the great engine inside of Skya, known as the Forge, begins to rumble. But this was all a formality tended to by Carcat. I'll let him bore you with those details. For the rest of us, the game was done. I went to rejoin my friends, but as usual, even though I saved their asses, they didn't want anything to do with me. Instead, I decided to look for our fallen. I didn't bother with Tavros. He's a worthless disappointment. Instead, I looked for the body of Aradia. Even though I never found it, I knew better than to assume she was dead for good. While everyone else celebrated and Karkat worked to finish the final few tasks, I went back to my home on the land of maps and treasure. Sprites can't be taken outside of the medium, so I wanted to say goodbye to my mom one last time. Maybe I wanted to gloat that I had overcome her expectations. The others all prototyped their lusci too. Karkat got his crab dad, Salix got that weird two-headed giant thing, and Pfeffery even had her eldritch abomination. Even Gamzee had that stupid fucking sea goat. They all helped them on their quest, but my sprite never even spoke to me once. My mother was a spider, a giant one. She was the size of a house, and because she was so old she could barely move. By rights, she shouldn't have been alive. Most Lusai are like your human parents. They teach you about the world. They care for you. For me, it was the other way around. I cared for mom like a slave, washing her, warming her, and most of all, feeding her. When I finally got home, she wasn't there. All that remained was the empty gulch behind my house, in the sand where she used to sit, demanding meals, screaming at me, speaking in my mind telepathically, tugging on my leash, tightening my collar. At the time, I cried because I thought I was alone, because I missed her. But now I realize what truly happened. I was free. I am free. I never had freedom. Until the game started, I had to wear a metal chain around my fucking neck. And during the game, I was too busy fighting for my life to realize. It only became clear to me when that freedom went away. When the demon came. <laughs> I was so mad at all of you for taking my freedom away just as soon as I'd gotten it. But now I understand. This demon you sent us, this Beck Noir, this green electrified beast, he's not a curse. I destroyed the Black King. I can destroy this demon. So for that, humans, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Don't fear for us. Fear for that thing you sent. They all say I have a god complex. That's a fucking laugh. Maybe they're right. Maybe I do have a god complex. But what do you call a goddess with a god complex anyway? Who the hell cares?
Homestuck Alternate Universe is written, produced, and narrated by Funk McLovin. Also featuring Janaya as Kanaya, A.E. as Terezi, Bucky as Carcat, Pockin as Tavros, Shrimp as Nepeta, Technically Dead as Salix, Harper as Vriska, Eclippy as Gamzy and Equius, and West as Feffery. Illustrations are by Sunny Dionysus and Gastro. Please support Homestuck Alternate Universe on Patreon.com slash Funk McLovin for early access, behind the scenes, and bonus features, but mostly to simply support the efforts of independent creators. Homestuck was written by and is the creation of Andrew Hussey. Thank you for listening.